Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of... Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail Julia Ward Howe. story is entitled Song of Glory, a true story of the immortal Julia Ward Howe. Our first act curtain will rise in a moment, but first... This story about a courageous American woman of the past prompts me to say a few words about courageous American women of the present who are serving their country as service women in the United States Army and United States Air Force. They have the gratifying knowledge that they are writing new pages in the history book during one of the most critical periods in our nation's history. You can join these women by volunteering in the WAC, Women's Army Corps, or in the WAF, Women in the Air Force. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and enlist now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Song of Glory. Let me tell you about the girl humming that tune. Her name is Julia Ward. Someday she's going to sing a thunderous song of freedom, a battle cry for equality. But she isn't singing that song of freedom yet. She's just an ordinary girl in the Boston of the 1840s, a bit prettier than average, but still very much like a lot of girls you know yourself. Julia's mother died when she was a little girl, and so her father raised her. There were some things he could teach her, but she had to learn for herself the bitterness of life, and she had to learn harshly. One of these she was to learn the night in her life when she met Samuel Howe. Good night, Reverend Barker, and thank you for bringing your friend, Mr. Howe. Good night, Mr. Howe. Miss Ward, I feel I cannot leave without apologizing. Apologizing, Mr. Howe? My conversation was not entirely pleasing to you. It would have been better had I not discussed my work. On the contrary. A description of your day makes ours seem like a sugar-water existence. You will accept my apology, all the same. Of course, Mr. Howe, since you feel compelled to extend it. Good night, Mr. Howe. An evening well spent, Julia. In some ways, you're quite the hostess your mother was. In some ways, Father. Did I do something wrong? Well, I must say Sam Howe is a brilliant man. I've never heard a talker quite like him. And he doesn't have to wet his tongue to do it. He had much to talk about. Well, I'm tired. I'm afraid you showed evidence of that while Mr. Howe was talking. Did I? I didn't mean to. Did you really try, Julia? I know what you mean, that I was rude and showed what I felt of his conversation. But it was for everyone's sake. It was so terrible listening to all that talk about incurable blindness, cripples, insanity. Julia, he is establishing a foundation here in Boston. I don't care. It was horrible listening to it all. Can't you see what Julia! It... Julia, stop it this instant. What? Here. Here, Julia, sit down beside me. I have something to tell you. You're 23. For 16 years now, I've been both mother and father. And perhaps not very successful as either. Oh, but father... You... But one thing's certain. I changed a great deal with your mother's death. When she died, I was left very much alone. But I soon realized that I had to work to fill the bleak emptiness left by her death. Samuel Howe is doing that for others. For those who cannot help themselves to a fuller life. Are you healthy, pretty, talented? So are most of your friends. Tonight, perhaps for the first time, 
you realize there are others in the world not so wonderfully fortunate as you. Those are the people Mr. Howe is trying to help. I like to think of Sam Howe as, well, as a pioneer. There are too many people who don't know that these people exist and need help. Too many who seem to despise them for their ills. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, what can I say? Don't ask that question. Ask yourself instead what you can do. Miss Ward. I was told I'd find a young lady waiting in my office. You didn't expect it to be me. Well, I was afraid my behavior in your home the other night... It was I who should have behaved differently, Mr. Howe. You were an excellent hostess, Miss Ward. No. No, I was rude and abrupt. And worse than that, I was intolerant. Thank you for coming and telling me that. I, I came for another reason. My father enjoys your company very much, and with Reverend Barker returning to Washington, I was afraid for his sake. Only for his sake? For mine, too. I could profit from knowing you, Mr. Howe. I hope you'll come often to our house. Thank you. I hope you'll come often to visit me here. Father says that someday this may be an historic clinic. What a great sense of satisfaction it must give you to, to bring hope into lives surrounded by darkness. I look upon what they bring to my life a great deal. For the lame, the blind, see more clearly than we. Through suffering, their eyes have seen a glory that's denied to you and me. With this deepening sense of values, a new feeling was sweeping over Julia Ward. Perhaps distantly, she was hearing the first notes of the great song of freedom she was to write. But at that time, the music she heard had other meanings for her. <laughs> We've danced three in a row. Sure I'm not tiring you? I feel very happy. Not tired in the least. I'm afraid I haven't made much progress with these new steps. You've made amazing progress. What about the new steps you've taught me to take? Any progress? It's amazing to me you're able to work the long hours you do. More amazing, you understand so much of the work in so short a time. But you should spend more time on the poetry you're beginning to write. The work at the clinic gave it its beginning. That and something else. Something father says every young girl is bound to feel. You mean there's uh, someone toward whom you feel... Drawn. Someday I hope to feel worthy of his affection. A man must be a fool not to have shown you that you are. The man himself will tell you that his progress is very slow. Julia, you mean... Sam, how? Who do you think I mean? Julia Ward and Samuel Gridley Howe were married in the spring of 1843, and then the gradual procession of years, patient years, years of struggle so that others might walk with sturdy limbs and a sense of sight, the path through the years. And because they were two people in love, joy had its counterpoint of sorrow, two themes building in the heart that was to give the world its song of freedom. An evening in the Howe home in Boston in the early months of the year 1861. And you say you've looked everywhere, Jenny? In every one of his hiding places, Mother. Then I will come out of hiding, oh. Mrs. Howe, so that Jenny may search for her young suitor. <laughs> My mother. Mr. Whittier was hiding in that chair all the time. <laughs> Please accept the apologies of a crotchety poet, Miss Howe, and seek that young man. <laughs> I will, Mr. Whittier. The reason for my disappearance was that I was meditating on a dedication for a volume of verse to the charming wife of Samuel Howell. John Greenleaf Whittier wishes to dedicate a book of verse to me? All evening I've been wanting to ask you if I may, but the word, the phrase to describe you, perhaps it can be found in your work for the blind, the disabled. That work is a dedication in itself. I've learned strong lessons. That, perhaps, is the secret of all great work. I've done very little. You may look upon it that way. I, too, feel your greatest work is yet to come. 
I don't understand what you mean. I don't really know myself, except that... Well, you have recognized this quality in others, so you must know what I mean. You've given a welcome and encouragement to young Mr. Whitman for this reason. When the rest of us have, well... Rather shunned him, haven't you? Yes. Because his verse sounds ragged to your ears. There's little music in a muted drum roll. But when it speaks loud and full, you'll listen. Freedom speaks through Walt Whitman. Your love of equality. To this I could write my dedication. And yet it doesn't tell everything either. What of Julia, the mother, whose many sorrows... I've given three children to God and find great joy in the one that he has left to me. Jenny, how like my golden girl if she had lived. How happy it must make you that such a nice young man is in love with her. It has brought me the greatest happiness of my life. I think Arthur Stanley was sent to make up for many sorrows. My son, Richard, would have had just that honest look on his face. George would have had his vigor. Yes, Arthur Stanley is a nice young man. And the flowers spring to blossom where she works. Oh, Arthur, Mr. Whittier would really get a chuckle if he knew you were reading his poetry well, to me. He says he sings a lot better than I could. Oh, silly. Your own way's good enough for me. Except for some of the things you say. They frighten me. Because you're afraid to open your eyes. Can't you see what's happened? President Lincoln has been handed a, a lighted fuse. The next few weeks may determine whether there'll be a union or not. Well, need there be a war to decide this? With the possibility existing, we can't live in a world of sentiment and poetry. Why, even your mother's poetry doesn't face the real problems. I think, Arthur, the real oh. problem is one we're all afraid to oh. face. Even you. Mrs. Howe, I'm sorry I had oh, no, no please idea. Please don't apologize. You're right, Arthur. We don't admit to ourselves what it really means. War. You speak of the nation, it will tear asunder, and that's a terrible thing. But have even you, Arthur, given thought to the lives and hopes that will be torn as well? I... I wish there were some other way. That's what I meant when I said I that... I know what you meant. It's a great tragedy that we cannot bring our experience to bear and find a solution to the problems with our minds. The president is trying to do this. And every day you and I pray that he will be successful. And yet all Arthur talks of is fighting or going away to fight. I'll have to, Jenny, if it comes to war. But with the president working so hard, how can it come to war? A single shot can start a war. It could come any day. There's a garrison commanding the entrance to Charleston Harbor. I've heard that it'll be fired upon unless it surrenders within a week. Could this start a war? We must pray with our president that it will not. A military post that no one even knows the name of. I think the garrison Arthur's referring to is called Fort Sumter. At 4.30 in the morning of April 12, 1861, a dull report jars the heavy, oppressive silence of Charleston Harbor. Hundreds of eyes watching on the shore follow a spark as it hurtles through the darkness. Swinging over the harbor, it descends, seems to hover for a split second, then bursts into flame. War has come. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, Song of Glory. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Love and loyalty to one's country have never been the exclusive attributes of men. Women, too, have given concrete evidence of their devotion and courage. Now, more than ever before, the services of women are urgently needed to undertake thousands of jobs in the armed forces, where a critical manpower shortage threatens the defense effort. More than ever before, the United States Army and United States Air Force needs young women in its expanding forces. So go to your nearest Army and Air Force recruiting station. Have a talk with the recruiting sergeant. He'll help you decide how you can best serve your country. Volunteer for service in the WAC, Women's Army Corps, or in the WAF, Women in the Air Force. Do it today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Song of Glory. Discord and anxiety were the two themes playing counterpoint in the heart of the nation. 
Julia Howe listened to the angry notes, the timpani of hate. And in a paper published by her husband and herself, the Commonwealth, she sought to find a way out of the discord. Her pen wrote tirelessly, articles, editorials, in spite of her anxious thoughts for Arthur Stanley and others about whom there'd been no word for six months since the outbreak of war. And then in the twilight of an autumn day that same year, at the Howe home in Boston. Julia. What? Jenny and I have a surprise for you. Oh, what sort of... Jenny, I think your mother's ready. When do you see? Mother, look who's come home to us. Arthur. Hello, Mrs. Howe. Why, Arthur. Well, you look wonderful, doesn't it? Uh-huh. You gave us no word that you were coming. Well, I wrote as soon as I got leave from my regiment. But I got here ahead of the letter. He said sometimes when our letters were delayed, he'd get hold of a copy of the Commonwealth. It was like a letter from home. Not only to me, knowing the work you put into it, but to all the men fighting with me. Like a letter from home? Knowing the folks back home were in the fight, too. And only a moment ago, I was really beginning to doubt if the effort was succeeding. This will only inspire her to work all the later into the night. Mm, not if I have anything to say about it. The general order was issued that all soldiers must return to their regiment at once. I only have a few hours with you. Well, we'll make them count, won't we, Mother? Oh, we will. Yes, you can be sure we will. He's gone. Carriage has disappeared down the road. Hampton will bring Jenny back from the station. Shall we leave a light burning? Your last words to him were, Good night, son. Well, you'll soon be marrying our daughter. If our sons had lived... They'd be like him, yes. I'm sure of it. Strong. You know, I think his strength has doubled. The strength from within. That is where it comes from, I think. You going to leave this light burning for Jenny? I'm going to stay and work by this lamp for a moment. All right, Julia. Good night, dear. Good night, dear. If there is strength in his body, there's strength in my hand. I gave my son a palace and a kingdom to control. The palace of his body, the kingdom of his soul. Hey, will somebody stop playing that tune for just a minute so I can get on with this letter? Oh. Dearest Jenny. It's not easy writing by the light of a kerosene lamp. Not easy to keep that tune out of your head. Every harmonica plays it in the soldier's camp. But I'm getting used to it. Even to the shells falling near our encampment. Harmless lightning flashes. And when one comes closer than the others, shaking the position... And you hear the harmonica still playing the same tune. You're sort of glad to have a battle hymn, even one that has no words. He says they're camped at a place near Manassas. Mother, are you listening? Yes, dear. I know where Manassas is and how cold it can be in the winter. But he says we probably haven't heard of the place they're camped. How far from Manassas is Bull Run? Sam. Sam, you don't suppose she saw this letter. Was it lying here like this? I think so. I don't blame her for reading it. We've been acting so strangely, wounded so badly. We've got to find her. You don't suppose she's gone to be with him? It's what I'm very much afraid of. She'll be in very letter. Where is it? He, he says, in all conscience, I cannot ask you to come here to Washington. The opposing sides in the retreat from Bull Run have come this far and are posted on opposite sides of the Potomac, shelling each other constantly. An attack is expected momentarily. Oh, Sam. I'll leave at once for Washington. He will help us. I'm going with you. You've been through an illness. I must go. There are two young people in... Two young people closer to us than all the world. Late. I'm glad you arrived before nightfall. They wouldn't bring the train into Washington. We had to take a carriage from the last stop. Have you seen her, Reverend Parker? She came here. I arranged for her to visit him at his bedside. 
She remained to look after him and care for the other patients, too. Little Jenny. And Arthur. Will he live? I cannot say. But the workings of Providence are not known to me in this hour of crisis. I have not abandoned my faith or my belief that some goodness comes of all suffering. But what I've seen frightens me. I've often thought of the solemn marches in the night. But the danger lies in the wrath that is stored in their hearts and minds. Wrath that God alone can remove. Let's go, quickly. <laughs> Julia Ward Howe went with her husband and the Reverend Barker to the Union encampment on the Potomac. Sentries walked in the dusk of the night that was closing in on the watchful camp. Faintly from across the river came sounds from the camp on the opposite shore, watching and waiting, too. And as they moved along the silent rows of tents, Julia Howe heard for the first time that tune that every soldier's harmonica had picked up. It was as though every soldier who had played it had passed along the ragged phrasing to the next for Julia Howe to hear, with all its imperfections, this cold December night in her life. Here are the hospital tents. Arthur Stanley is in this one. Will you go in, Mrs. Howe? Thank you, Reverend Barker. Sam, look. Mother. Jenny. Father. You shouldn't have come. Oh, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Reverend Barker, for bringing them. Oh, there, Jenny, there, there. I didn't mean to leave you, but I did. I had to be with Arthur. Of course you did. How is he? Oh, Mother. What is it, dear? Come, he's over here. His head is all bandaged. I changed the bandages this morning when the doctor came to look at the wound. You've been very brave. That's because you see me now. You wouldn't have said that if you'd been here when the doctor told me. About Arthur? What did he say, Jen? The wound is too deep. Take his hand. Sit beside him. While I do what I can for the others. Julia Ward Howe sat at the bedside of Arthur Stanley, watching hopefully for the first sign of waking or recognition. Her daughter moved silently among the other wounded in the tent, tending to them with a patience and skill born of no other knowledge than that which their needs had given to her. Mrs. Howe, your husband and I feel that you should leave the camp now. The shelling has begun from across the river. I know. I can hear the bursts. I think he can, too. I saw him stir just now as though the sound had reached him. You think he's waking, Julia? See what you think, Jenny. I, I think he is. Uh, Mrs. Howe, we are concerned about your safety. Thank you, Reverend Barker, but I can't leave now. I, I wouldn't want to leave. Jenny. Oh, yes. Yes, Arthur. Jenny, you're in danger. Shelling. Oh, they're landing far away. They'll come closer during the night. You stop worrying. See who's come to visit you. Hello, Arthur. Oh, tell Jenny shouldn't have come. Jenny's been an angel. His, his tears are like a man. They're very much like the son you've become to us. There's gentleness in your great courage. I, I promise to look after Jenny. Will you do that for me when I... Oh, no. No, I don't say that. Jenny. Anything takes you away now. Jenny, I, I used to think there was danger in those harmless flashes of man-made lightning in the air. Now I know they never touched me. Arthur. Jenny, they never touched me, for I have seen his fateful lightning. Dearest, dearest. He used to write of comfort that tomb gave him to others. I wonder if he can still hear it. He called it a battle hymn, played on a harmonica, a hymn needing words. Jenny, shall we take you home now? Not now. 
I want to sit here a moment. Very well, dear. I'll come back for you. A hymn needing words. Are the words out there in the silence? Or up there in the sky, torn by light and sound? Through suffering, our eyes can see a glory denied to other men. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The danger lies in the wrath stored in their hearts and minds. Wrath that God alone can remove. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. I have seen his fateful lightning. He has full lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth, his truth is marching on. Darling, I've been looking for you. Forgive me for frightening you. I wandered further than I realized. Where's Jenny? Back there. She wishes to stay and continue caring for the sick and wounded. Little Jenny. Well, we must follow her example, Sam. We, too, have much work to do. Do you hear that tune? I want you to listen to some words I'd like to put on paper. Side by side, Julia Howe and her husband left the encampment on the Potomac, where that night, out of suffering and trial, was born a hymn, a hymn destined to give courage to those whose solemn marches fill the night and to those who watch and wait through the night. Julia Ward Howe had written a battle hymn for the times, a hymn that was to become a song of freedom for the world. You have just heard an interesting story about one of America's gallant women of the past. If you're between the ages of 18 and 34, you're invited to join America's gallant women of the present, who now serve in the WAC, Women's Army Corps, and the WAF, Women in the Air Force. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Get all the details today. <laughs> This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This program featured a cast of outstanding players. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>